year period is even beyond the volume four that we're working on now. That's volume five. So I won't pretend to know very much about the Afghan operations. But what I'd like to do is to draw your attention back to the historical link of 23 Field Squadron and their involvement in the Afghan uh, operations. 23 Field Squadron was one of some 50 or 60 engineer units during the Second World War that was disbanded as the war wound up or as it was concluded. Unlike many of the other arms regiments in particular, uh, engineers were very practical. When the engineer unit finished its job, we just said, okay, job's done, sign off on the war diary. You're now disbanded. That disappears into history, sometimes never to be found again. But we did find 23 Field Company, 23 Field Squadron again. 23 Field Company was perhaps one of the more famous engineer units of the Second World War because of their involvement in Operation Market Garden, the, uh, the bridge too far. <coughs> After that bridge too far, there was a horrendous number of Allied airborne troops uh, that were essentially surrounded. And there was a very hastily devised plan to try to use the engineer units to extricate uh, many of those trapped soldiers uh, across the Native Ryan uh, River at night. And it was the Canadian engineers that were responsible for most of the success of that operation. 20 Field Company, 23rd Field Company combined uh, worked with two of the British engineer companies and over that one night under heavy enemy fire uh, resulted, accomplished the extrication of more than 2,000 basically trapped uh, allied paratroopers. Uh, they are remembered for that. They are remembered amongst the allies. They are remembered amongst the European uh, locals. Uh, there is a monument in Drill uh, to honor that particular engineer contribution. After the end of the Second World War, when the Canadian engineers were trying to develop their peacetime post-war structure, uh, it was decided that our field engineer or combat engineer representation would be one field squadron, a single field squadron. A lot of discussions went on as to what we were going to call that unit. Eventually, it was decided to name that unit, to number that unit, 23rd Field Company, Field, Field Squadron, in honor of the tremendous contributions of that particular company during the war. 23 Field Squadron went on to fight in Korea, renamed with one of the many <coughs> reorganizations uh, of the, uh, the Army Engineers. And that number, 23 Field Squadron, was to reappear in 2CER when we formed the Engineer Regimental Organization. <coughs> when the history of 23 Field Company, Second World War, was being written, Major Tucker, the commanding officer, very wisely wrote in the 23rd story, the story of that particular unit, if in the future another unit is raised to bear the name of this company, which was born of this war, then it shall have a proud tradition to uphold. That tradition is indeed proudly upheld today by 23rd Field Squadron in Petaluma. We're privileged this evening to have Mark Esperado speak to us about his experience in leading that company in Afghanistan in operation a unit that very well mirrored uh, the history of the unit here in the Second World War. Unit awards as a result of the operations in Afghanistan included the Star of Courage, 
Medal of Military Valor, four Meritorious Service Medals, two MIDs, and 11 commendations. Mark has gone to the trouble after his experiences there to express them in writing. For those of us who have read Clearing the Way, we've got a good understanding of what the unit did, and the unit's a better understanding. A pleasure to introduce Mark, who will speak to us about engineers in Afghanistan. Now, ladies and gentlemen, my aim over the next 30 minutes is to give you an overview of future shield squadrons deployment and our province of Afghanistan in 2006-2007 as part of the 1R Sierra Battle. To characterize the tour, a few things come to mind. It was extremely violent. At that time, it was punctuated by many individual acts of bravery and determination, all underpinned by the squadron's collective ingenuity and adaptability. Before I go on, I'd like to honor one person who is there with me, and that's National Warrant Officer Derek Marcu. Are you now a captain? Gonna, gonna be a captain. <laughs> but Derek, there's one problem with you being here. Yeah, what? <laughs> <laughs> and that is nothing ruins a war story more than an eyewitness. <laughs> so having said that, this is Two Tree Shield Squadron's story as I experienced it and as I remember it as their former commander. The doctrinal role of military engineering, military engineers, is to allow friendly forces to live, move, and fight on the battlefield and to deny the same to the end. Because of the nature of the way the task force, the Canadian task force, is structured, the majority of the assets belong to that field squadron. So we provided that support to the Canadian Task Force, the Battle Group, and, and other allied forces. And we did that based on this group of men and women, 135 strong, from across the Canadian forces and beyond, and across the three services, Naval Clearance Divers, Air Force, Electronic Warfare Techs, and a whole bunch of trades uh, from the Army. 135 all grouped around a core of combat engineers, and we had a heavy equipment section, geospatial engineering detachment, four explosive ordnance disposal teams who also took care of IEDs. Midway through the tour, a troop of armored engineers came from Edmonton. And several times we had U.S. group clearance packages. Seen down here, this is before Canada had its own. Uh, inherent capability. At times we had UK search teams attached and towards the end of the tour we had 10 explosive detection dog teams contracted that came under the engineering control. So that was two tree field squadrons. In a context, it's a very typical area in Afghanistan in terms of the construction and how the people live. Everything is a compound. The wall is built first and then the buildings on the inside. Even the roads have walls on either side. Even the fields have walls on either side often. It makes for very canalizing terrain. Very difficult to fight in as well. West of Kandahar City, the green belts are either marijuana or these gray fields. Top in the summer, you can see the foliage, the bottom in the winter. And what the parallel oak roads created was trench line after trench line. So it's no wonder that the insurgents chose to fight in this area against NATO forces. The Red Stand Desert, and that flows, that Red Sea of Sand, about 80 kilometers to the south of the Pakistani border. We didn't fight in that area, but we fought in the area to the left, and you can see the green belts. That's the Argandab River, I believe. But what would happen when you would drive on this hard packed sand is it would turn into moon dust, a talcum like powder which would get everywhere. So that that was the environment that we were operating in. In terms of the human environment, and I would suggest this was a much more difficult landscape to navigate. 
if, from my perspective, not just a foreign culture, but an alien one to what we're used to in the West. And I think, despite all of our best efforts, we'll always be strangers in a strange land. Zeroing in on the area of operations, unlike the tour before us and the tour after, who were all over Kandahar province, which is about the size of New Brunswick, I believe. The 1 RCR battle group did most of the fighting in a 10 by 10 kilometer patch of ground. And that drove the way we did operations, and it allowed me to conduct centralized engineer operations in support of a battle group that was operating as a battle group. Highway 1 running east-west in that part of the province, Kandahar City is about 35 kilometers off uh, to the right. Patrol Base Wilson and Afghan National Army, Afghan National Police uh, outpost that coalition forces uh, staged out of uh, throughout uh, my tour, certainly in subsequent tours. There's this collection of roads making up you know, the Serpentine Road linking Wilson to Tajmal. The Argandab River running uh, northeast to southwest, and on the south side, there's the town of Barry Panjwai, and the high feature Mashin Gar, Gar being the Pashto word for mountain. So focusing on the southern part of that, that graphic, you have Pajmol and the White School, which was the center of the insurgent main defensive area. And we're talking uh, about a thousand uh, insurgents in that concentrated in that area. They're not seen since. On the south side, you've got three battle positions. 302 eventually was turned into FOB, the Fort Operating Base Mashing Guard. So the initial parts of Off Medusa uh, are focused on this area. Preliminary route moves from Medusa started on the 1st of September 2006. When forces were in place up at Patrol Base Wilson and along those three battle positions, aerial and artillery bombardment of the main, the insurgent main defensive area occurred along with targeting of other known command and control nodes. So on the left you see the Canadian M777-155 howitzer, and on the right you see a HIMARS missile strike. And those missiles were launched from Kandahar airfield, um, typically targeting uh, C2 nodes. Pretty impressive uh, display of bombardment against the enemy. From an engineer perspective, in terms of, in terms of our move mandate, not so impressive uh, because we didn't think we'd be fighting that kind of fight. So two troops on the top built, man portable, lab attachable ramps that were meant to allow a, a lab or a light armored vehicle, which you see on the right, top right, to cross a small gap. Going back to part of that ingenuity and adaptability. On the bottom, you see heavy equipment that's been up armored in an ad hoc fashion by welding steel plate to the cab to give the operator a modicum of protection from small arms. And the troops called that Mad Max. This is what we had to go to war with, and this is what we used to breach natural and man made obstacles from the use of. So on the 3rd of September, the order was given to assault the white school. So in the foreground, this is battle position 302 at Masoom Gar. In the background, you see Pajmol and the white school, and you see the first wave of Charles Company Group, uh, which has gone across the river. In the summer, it was essentially dry. And then you see the Dunnelmeyer uh, down here. Uh, driven by Master Corporal Lance Hooper, doing quite a faithful tour. This is the view through my lab, my sights, and you can see the labs on the far side um, engaged in a fight uh, inside that main defensive area. Um, essentially, they drove uh, an attack in a frontal manner right through the insurgent kill zone. My gunner had picked up movement and depth, and we were killing Taliban insurgents reinforcing that position at 2,400 meters away. 
And I can tell you, killing in that distance is very much like a video game. It looks like that on the screen. And Dave Grossman talks about that in his book on killing. But that's very different emotion and very different experience than what the troops were facing in that close in battle. Very different. The result of the 3rd of September was an unsuccessful attack. That's been characterized many different ways, uh, both by the Army and in the media. But we lost the fight that day. Four Canadians were killed, including Sergeant Shane Stachnik and Sister Field Squadron. The three vehicles were abandoned or destroyed in the kill zone. One of them being the ZL that Master Corporal Lance Cooper was driving. It was at the casualty collection point and it took either an RPG or an 82 millimeter round. It didn't kill Hooper, it injured him, but killed two others based on the shrapnel um, and, and the spray. And that bucket was returned to TCR and it sits out front uh, of the regiment right now as a reminder. So we we threw back to Masoon Gar to regroup. And in the morning of the 4th of September, our position was mistaken as an enemy position by a US A-10 aircraft, and we were straight. So what you see there is a mass casualty situation with one dead and about 35 injured. Quite luckily, there weren't that many more killed. And I remember that day quite vividly. I was in the turret of my lab, and you can see that just on the bottom right where my gun is. And Don had just broken, and I see a flash of lights off to the left, almost like sparklers. And then three to four seconds later, there was that unmistakable sound of the E-10 30 millimeter cannon firing off a burst, a very short burst. I think the pilot knew he made a mistake right away. And in fact, came up on the air and said, pilot error. So we had to fly in a black, two Blackhawks, Medivac birds, and a Chinook to take out all the injured. And they had to be transferred to three different hospitals um, because they would have overwhelmed Canada Air I lost uh, five or six um, sappers from two troops to injuries that day. That rendered Charles Company Group ineffective from a combat perspective. They were at about 60% strength or less based on the losses of the 3rd and the 4th of September. Two troop physically wasn't combat ineffective, but mentally and emotionally they were very close. So I kept them under my wing uh, after that, and they tended to do the centralized engineer operations where I could be present, whereas one troop was often given uh, independent tasks. So this necessitated a change in the plan. And while that plan was being changed, um, we maintained the high ground and pressure on that main defensive area Luckily for us, there were no civilians in that area. Either they'd been evicted by the insurgents to build defenses, or we had done leaflet drops before and they had left town, turning it into a free fire zone, which meant if it had two legs and moved, we killed it. And that was very much the philosophy. On the 7th or 8th of September, I can't remember, we were no longer in the south in terms of the main effort. We had shifted the bulk of the Canadian battle group up around Kandahar City to the north and staged at our patrol base Wilson. In the south, we left um, Rexy Squadron and they, the remnants of Charles Company, and they were attached to a U.S. task force. And you'll see, uh, you'll see the, how that plays out a bit later. So a couple things here. You see Route Comox, which was the center line of our axis of advance. But we couldn't use the road because it was heavily mined and ID. You see the dotted lines, and that's where those dozers created breaches through the, the wadis or the great fields to allow the Canadian forces to move up in a very methodical manner. And our first, uh, so Cracked Roof was the first uh, wadi and report line, and the intermediate objective was Templar, which was a small hamlet of. So by this time, we had some reinforcements. So on the right, you see a D7 dozer bored, by the, or bored from the Afghan National Army. 
Uh, and they didn't want to lend it to us. Um, you know, they were wise in that regard, but frankly, it was their war. Uh, now Major John Hayward signed for that, $450,000, and that plays out a bit later. Uh, in the middle, you see the D6, and that was liberated from the UK. They didn't even know they had it in Canada Harrowfield, and Derek, I don't know if you're the one that found it. And on the left, you see uh, a D8 dozer, which we rented. And I can tell you the contractor had no idea what we were doing. <laughs> <laughs> this picture was taken by Graham Schmidt, the then of the Globe and Mail. And that's that, that's a D7, I'm not sure who's operating it, reaching that first wadi. So although it's a dry, and it's really a, you know, a small canal, that still would have stopped lab movement. What you don't see there are the 150 soldiers out to 300 meters protecting that vital asset. 300 meters is the effective range of an RPG. And what would happen is we would bomb the enemy, get them with artillery, close air, attack helicopters, snipers, whatever we had, and then the infantry would go out and secure that, and then the dozers would move up and create breaches, and then the labs would move up into open areas, and then the dozers would come back, reaching another making another combat road to allow for resupply. And we did that bound after bound after bound until we hit run. By this point though, we've been reinforced by a US Humvee company. And that's one of the bridges that the insurgents had blown up thinking that it would stop or slow down our movement. I don't think they thought that we would use dozers to break the landscape to create the mobility that was required by the battle group. And I see break the landscape because there were severe consequences for farmers and irrigation uh, after the fact that they're probably still sorting out. So here's Templar uh, and a great shot of my sappers mouse holding, so allowing the infantry to access a compound without going through the front door, which is likely booby trap. So we're halfway to rugby now and you can see um, there are two arrows coming in, so it was a pincer movement, Task Force Grizzly in the south, commanded by the Americans, but also with the remnants of those Canadian forces, and the battle group moving, and then we swept through rugby um, from the east to the west, but at that point, the vast majority of the insurgents had been squeezed out. There's some pictures of the drive south. So here you can see soldiers patrolling through the vineyards. So the hedgerows on either side. So you can see how tall they are. Very, very difficult terrain to operate in. And here's the link up. So on the left deck, Colonel Williams. On the right, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Lavoie, now General Lavoie. And you can see Williams using a 2-3 field squadron map. And the Americans were amazed that a squadron and a battle group had more geospatial assets than their battalions, brigades. Really, they didn't see that till divisional level. Very impressive in terms of our capabilities from a mapping and geospatial perspective. So what's left of the white school, you can just see it off on the right. And the insurgents like to use schools as defensive points because A, it was cinder block construction and not mud brick, but also by ISAF attacking them, we destroyed the schools that we had built. So there's the D8 dozer having cleared a patch of the great field. So you can see the kind of destruction uh, you know, that occurred to provide that mobility. Digging in around rugby for a counterattack that never occurred, but what did occur small IED teams that re-infiltrated the, uh, the area of operations to lay those uh, roadside bombs to hit us. So one of my jobs right after Musa was done was to keep Group Vancouver open, Comox and Vancouver. The line of communication between Patrol Base Wilson and Mashingar in the south. Very difficult and it's only clear as long as there's observation on it. And it was impossible to keep observation based on those roads 
um, serpentine in nature with walls on either side. And this section of Route Vancouver, uh, down by the White School Objective Rugby, is one of the most heavily IED roads anywhere in the world. And these weren't roadside bombs so much as tactical obstacles covered by fire. Because that was their kill zone, that was their main defensive area. You can see it, one of my EOD teams with uh, the robot going forward. You can see in the first line, which would have been used as the trigger to set off um, that artillery round. This is a map of the IED finds and strikes, and each one of these has a story. Um, Master Purple Medic, anyone heard of him? The sniper lost two legs. Well, that's where that happened. That's where I struck an IED. Hooper. Hooper's, Hooper owns half of that map. And, and we'll get to that in a minute. Each one of those has a story, often a very sad one. So that's the D7. So uh, John Hayward now on the Afghan for $50,000. We sort of had to make him scarce. In the hole is Petty Officer Jim Lee, Naval Clearance Diver. Amazing soldier, probably the most highly decorated um, sailor we had in the forces. And he's conducting a post blast investigation, just like CSI Canada. So this story leads to two others. So Hooper, that was his second strike. He went on to be blown up a third time. He's being awarded the Meritorious Service Medal here by the Governor General, not for being blown up three times, but for his devotion to duty, for getting back into another piece of heavy equipment and operating it in the war zone. And on the right is he too was blown up en route to doing a post blast investigation. His number two evacuated, broken leg. All of his equipment destroyed except for his bayonet. He cleared that scene, went back to the original scene, dug it up with his bayonet, turned out to be homemade napalm, collected all the forensics, so then got fed back into the system which allowed for the targeting of that bomb cell. And he was awarded the Star of Courage uh, for his action. Now this is my IED strike during the building of uh, Route Summit. Uh, the day before I was in Kandahar Airfield and I phoned home, I used to phone home every two weeks, I said, hey, I'm going outside the wire, I'll talk to you in a bit. Well, you know, that happened the next day. Um, so I had to go back to Kandahar Airfield I phoned her, I don't know, three days later. She said, what are you doing back to soon? I said, I just gotta get a tire change. <laughs> I didn't tell her, but actually the regiment knew. Uh, I ended up giving an interview to uh, NPR out of the States, their, you know, their version of CDC. Not thinking that that would get back. But my sister works in the States, heard the interview, downloaded it, sent it by email to everyone. So when I phone home the next time, my wife Shannon said, how's your laugh? I said, you know, don't you? <laughs> right? They always know. <laughs> uh, so this is some aerial uh, imagery. That starts, line up with that starts. Uh, it's too big to fit onto uh, one sheet. And you can see from space the destruction of Root Summit. Okay? Build that. And you can also see all the lines where our dozers have been. That's Route Summit, the start of it. It started as a combat road, right, during combat operations. Now, once maintaining Route Vancouver and Comox cleared, once that had become untenable, my orders were create me a road that only a company has to, whereby a company can uh, put on surveillance. So it needed to be as straight as possible, as flat as possible, and it needed to be cleared as wide as possible, even though the road was only in the middle, so you had to stand off. And those were my orders. I took them. We avoided all grave sites. We avoided all compounds. We had to take out a couple of compounds, but we did get the local permission 
but great fields and great putts with fair game. So here you see the D8 where the contractor found out about it and uh, requested it back. A demolition and great putt. I think we paid three thousand dollars US for great putt destroyed. Is that fair? Yeah. Finally, the badges came. So I no longer had to put heavy equipment troops in harm's way <coughs> unnecessarily. By far the most valuable piece of equipment the engineers had in the field. By far. And then you see on the left there, explosive removal of great cuts, 200 to 300 blocks of C4, and there's no chill like overkill, and there was nothing left. The locals came in and they were contracted to build all the culverts uh, and also to pave. And we did a lot, we did all the clearing and grubbing, um, building of the sub base, a lot of the graveling. And you can see the guys on the top right there doing the survey. But it's a tactical problem before it's a technical one. That is when people are trying to kill you. So there were three strong points built along Route Summit to afford us the protection required to build that road. It was very World War I-esque uh, in the way those guys lived in the trenches really. Um, fighting patrols would go out. The Strong Point Center saw a lot of violence. And you can see on that spot bottom right, that's where Williamson and Tedford were killed. And the cross in the middle belongs to Josh Kluge, and he stepped on an IED uh, not far from that. And that wasn't a legacy ID, that, had, that was one that had been in place post Medusa. You see that's an artillery uh, barrage against uh, an insurgent concentration of the packing strong point west. And we would sit up at the top of Masoom Gar, um, and we'd almost treat it you know, like a theater night. Uh, and and we watch those fireworks go off, and it was, the violence was impressive. And when we weren't fighting insurgents, we were fighting Mother Nature. So I was reminded of a few realities here. Uh, it rains in the desert. Uh, when it rains in the desert, there'll be flooding. And no matter where you are in the world, water flows downhill. Because when we had built Summit originally, we had filled in all the wadis as a counter IED method, because that way they couldn't infiltrate in the low ground. There's been an eight year drought. Well, we were made to pay for my oversight. That water's flowing at about three meters per second, and underneath that is root summer. Bottom left is the Argandab River uh, after those rains. So that's a big river, and it could take that flow, and we could, we could build a causeway to get across it. The day I handed over to Jake DeLuga, they opened up the Dallas Dam. Yep. And that is a that's the Argandab River. And we had no bridging in theater to cross it. None whatsoever. The Brits when they went to Hellman brought rafts. Um we had nothing. So despite our ingenuity, uh, there was really not much we could do for that battle group in terms of movement across that that wet gap. Yeah, but frankly, that was a Roto 3 problem at that point, and I was just heading home. <laughs> <laughs> the root summit was paved on the rotation at uh, Roto 3, I was Roto 2, and you can see some shots there. And then on rotation 4, and I, this is Walter Taylor's, I think it's Walter Taylor's tour with the Van Dues. Um, they had that causeway design, and it was designed so the water could just flow over top of it, that uh, the be. Uh, as a permanent solution to crossing the Argandab River, connecting, fully connecting patrol base Wilson to uh, Mashin Gar. So for those who've been out to Mashin Gar, this is what it looked like before it was a Ford operating base. And even then you can see the boys have done some work here, putting in a road to this runoff position for some overwatch uh, to the west. And over the course of the tour, or about the five months we had left, four and a half months, and this is where the live mandate comes in. And although I didn't have construction engineers, they did come out 
um, field engineers, combat engineers built uh, a lot of the source protection works, did a lot of the drainage. You can see that a section of the of infantry would live in that bunker. We eventually built the road to the top. Well, in fact, uh, Mohammed, our uh, Pakistani um, heavy equipment operator and the excavator built that road. Uh, and did we double his salary that year with the Christmas bonus? We gave him a bonus. Yeah, we gave him, we gave him a huge bonus. Uh, but an incredible operator built in that road. And that allowed uh, tanks and labs to get right up there and have a commanding view of the whole region. And you can see the town that had been built up. You know, if you, you think back two slides when we started with nothing, uh, by the end of the tour, uh, that's what was built. Perhaps too much was built as we became very fob focused, tied to ground, tied to tactical infrastructure. So in the end, uh, I don't know if it was the right thing to do operationally, uh, but from an engineering perspective, uh, pretty impressive. And we did the same thing at Spurwangar, which was uh, further west on the south side of the Argandab River. That's a naturally occurring uh, you know, mud feature, essentially. We built that up quite a bit in terms of the bunkers and in terms of the internal road uh, system. And we built a road from Spurwangar uh, out to Root Fosters um, because before, it was another route Vancouver, serpentine, high walls, very dangerous. We also didn't win any friends in terms of the farmers who own that. Uh, and you can see some of the, uh, the bunker construction. So hopefully with that brief overview, I've given you an idea of what 2-3 Shield Squadron uh, accomplished. I've hit on a few of the mistakes. Uh, I can assure you there were, there were many more. Um, but in the end, we, we enabled friendly forces, Canadian, Afghan, NATO, and otherwise, to live, move, and fight on the battlefield. So in the crucible of Operation Medusa, and in the killing fields of Kandahar province, I believe that members of 2-3 Field Squadron joined the ranks of the old fleet, upholding a very proud tradition of need. And so ended another chapter in this squadron story history. Thank you very much. Three or four minutes. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yes, sir. Did the locals use this road at the Delta, or they did, was it sort of restricted to your forces? <coughs> Uh, I'll actually let Derek answer that. So when I left, um, very few locals had moved back into the area. Um, you know what? I'll defer to Colonel Molovician. He was Task Force Engineer in Roto, uh, what, 2008? Yeah, exactly. And uh, he had a better uh, understanding of what happened afterwards. Yeah, so bottom line is absolutely. So with all this effort, um, some opened up, the, the trade opened up the uh, Opened up the area. The local certainly did use it, but again, this one started coming back. It started coming back out of Kandahar City, and again, at a very slow, measured pace. Uh, but it certainly did, it did use it. And even the second group, those people put brown, brown, are using that as well. So absolutely. But again, but not right away. Is our is our Andrew grew up a lot? Yeah. From 2006 to 2008, I think uh, someone. I mentioned some numbers when I was there on, the, on, on my second row, and uh, it, it was almost 100 times more uh, economic activity. Yeah, the bazaar started to flourish in the bazaar in the way, started to get trade back and forth with Kandahar, and so they started to see that happening. Any other questions? I had one, but I forgot. Well, how many armored engineer vehicles and weapons did you have? So four were deployed, four ADVs. Yeah. Yes. So four badgers came overseas yes. uh, with three crews. Um, so we and we used all three uh, extensively. 
by me. How many did we lose? Uh, we lost one uh, on Nathan Packer's tour. Uh, it had hit an IED, and I think it, it ended up melting to the ground. It did burn. Yeah, it burned for about uh, uh, around 12, 14 hours. And uh, there's a picture of the guy who went before me in, uh, in the Germans who uh, got three more from the Germans to help us finish our uh, operations. Yeah. We only had nine. We only had four. Nine. Only nine total. I don't know if the word Amazing. And we're getting the, the Badger 2 uh, being delivered in the next three, four years, I think. Project actually, I was speaking with the project developer, the project manager today. And work will be starting shortly on converting those leopard twos over to armored engineer vehicles. It's well on its way. So I think if we have you to thank, sir, then uh, thank you. Yeah, amazing, amazing.